Good morning, everybody. It's Stephen Corcoran here, and I'm going to talk about Northern Damselfly Survey that was undertaken at the end of last year, looking at all the historic sites in Strath's Bay and Deeside within the Cairngorms National Park. Northern Damselfly is a rare damselfly only found in the north of Scotland. And as you can see from the distribution map, it was restricted really to three main areas in Strath's Bay, Deeside and Highland Perthshire although his more recent records have been found outside these areas. Um, this species is classified endangered in the UK, and there's not been any proper assessment really done on this species since um, Bob and Betty Smith did work in the early 90s and produced a report in 1995. I thought it'd be useful just to do a very quick overview of the identification for people that are maybe unaware of this species. So as you can see, it's a sort of uh, blue and black damselfly. It's got distinctive blue-green under the eyes and on the bottom of the thorax and the males. There is two short black lines inside the, uh, the thorax as well. But And then there's a spear-shaped segment, a spear shape on segment two. Oh, this can be quite variable. So the diagnostic feature to look for is either side of the segment two, there is a, a distinct black line uh, and that's the key thing to look at. Females are a sort of distinctive you know, pea green colour. The larvae are, are actually quite easy to identify. Um, using a hand lens times 10, um, you can find distinct spotting behind the eyes. Though the work that I did at the end of last year, I didn't always see this um, present in quite a lot of the larvae I sampled. Um, but the key thing to look at is on the lamellae, there's a, a very clearly evident nodal line, and this is notched and quite hinge-like. Here are several other pictures of the larvae, and you can see here the very distinct nodal line and hinge-like lamellae on these two individuals and the dark sort of nodal line, which is quite clearly evident. Again, there's not really any spotting behind the eyes. But part of the reason why we can do survey work in the back end, like in October, December, is the larvae are, are quite active you know, in sedge vegetation and in water at this time of year compared to other species. Apart from large red damselfly, very few other species were recorded during sampling. So here's a couple of pictures of some typical northern damselfly habitat of various ponds taken in summertime to, sh to show all the vegetation. So they've got key things like it's woodland, there's pond weed in the water, there's this distinct fringe of sedges all the way around the edge and other emergent vegetation. And that seems to be one of the critical factors to look at in this species. So part of the reason why this species is endangered is not just because you know, it's very rare and only found in the north of Scotland, but we think that climate change could be having potentially have a big impact on this species. We're getting more dry summers, and so the water table and ponds is fluctuating quite a lot, which is leading to more succession as more vegetation grows. But also new species are coming in. So we've got azure damselfly and now found at sites um, which weren't you know, 20 years ago. And uh, also southern hawker is now found at many sites which it wasn't at 20 years ago. And then there's just the natural infilling of ponds, uh, possibly because we don't have things like beaver or elk anymore to keep them open. And then some ponds are lost to development or are deliberately filled in. And then there might be threats like plantations or drainage. Or as a, this example here, you can see at the top is the pond a couple of years ago, and the bottom is the same pond this year after probably a year or so of cattle being allowed to use it as a watering hole, completely destroying the vegetation and the whole pond. Okay, let's move on to the actual survey itself. So our objectives were to collect data on the the sort of known breeding sites of about 25 sites across um, Strathspey and Deeside within the Cairngorms National Park. 
and really to try and identify what management work they had done at those sites. And also look at those sites that hadn't been visited since the early 1990s. Um, and we also wanted to do, do a bit of a larval sampling just to check the presence of northern damselfly to see if they were still present at some of the, the older sites. And then the survey work was undertaken by me from the end of October through to mid-December, by which time we started winter sort of appeared in earnest and ponds started to get frozen. And then obviously we had restrictions due to COVID, so we weren't able to do everything we wanted to do in the time we had. So for each site, we collected the same data, I had a little table which collected information you know, on things like the size of the pond, how much of it was covered in emergent vegetation, which may be an underestimate because it's winter time, so a lot of species might not be evident in the water. I also collected water chemistry, pH, and we looked at habitat quality and you know, things like shade and it was the pond sheltered to the north. What was the sort of vegetation that was emerging from the edges of the pond? And then obviously where we could, we did larval sampling and we took photos and I draw a sketch match and then drew up um, the management that was needed at the site. The other thing we collected was uh, we collated all the species records for each site. So we've actually got, and the, the end result is we have a summary you know, sheet for each site with information collated and then list of management if, if it's needed, plus all the records for that site. So what did we find or what did I find really? Because I, I did have a little bit of help from Jen and one of her friends, they helped me on one day, but most of the work was done by me. So in the end, I actually managed to sample 43 sites in total um, that we had, we knew had historic records from, although several of those I couldn't find. But I think that was more down to, I think, incorrect grid references, possibly. Um, there are a couple of sites I wasn't able to visit. That was in D side. The, the rules changed on when you could travel, so I wasn't able to go back to D side and, and look at four sites. And then for nearly the entire period, Inch Marshes, the sites in, in and on the marsh were underwater, so they were inaccessible. And while I was out looking at ponds in the area, I quite often would check other ponds right next to it. So 11, 11 other sites were surveyed and I found three new ponds, uh, obviously next to existing sites that contain northern damselfly larvae. And I also managed to look at all 20 sites in Strasbourg that are in the, the 1995 Smiths report. For each site, I collected a, a list of what was growing around the, the, the site, the emergent vegetation and bank site vegetation. Sometimes just to the species group because my, my botany wasn't quite up for differentiating sedges or grasses. But the key thing that really came out was like 38 of the 43 sites had a fringe of sedges you know, all around them or around part of them. But also, you know, a high number of sites had sphagnum and, and rushes and pondweed. So those other three species seem to be quite important. Uh, well, things like reeds, horsetail and cotton grass were, were generally much more uncommon. They were found at less than 10 sites for those species. So again, it's that combination of the first um, four species is quite important. I should also just add that I didn't do any sampling of the, the species that were actually in the pond, you know, I didn't try and pull up plants that were growing you know, underneath the water on the surface. So I didn't actually look at the different you know, actual you know, aquatic species that are in the in the water. I just didn't have the botan botanical skills or, or really the time. Um, but it, it seems to be clear that pondweed must be quite important for larvae. They must use that for you know, potentially, or maybe that's an egg laying site. I don't know. Yes, and, you know, the other key thing that came out is that you know, majority of sites are associated with you know, pine and birch woodland, usually of, of ancient origin. And you know, many sites also had woodland shelter to the north, either directly next to the site, so, uh, and then were quite open to the south, um, which would you know, make them for a good, seems to be makes good for a good pond for damselflies and dragonflies generally. 
Uh, and the water chemistry data that I took you, all but one of the sites was acidic in nature, and with the majority being you know, around you know, 5.6 pH. Um, and during my netting, I used a, a large sort of pond net to collect in you know, larvae. I only found fish on one site. Um, but interestingly, I had lots of uh, newt efts or newt larvae uh, when I was doing the survey work. And, and that's quite unusual for, for, I thought, for so many of the sites to have overwintering uh, newt efts that would then obviously develop into adults later in the year. So of the sites I managed to net, there was 37 that managed to do some netting. We had you. Know, I found 17 that had northern damselfly larvae, which thought was quite a good proportion. Some of the sites you know, were quite difficult to sample, though. Um, and then we did have 193 other larvae species recorded across the sites, the majority being large red um, damselfly. And then I also did find some new sites for white-faced darter and northern emerald. So one of the things that had been done in the 1995 Smith's report is they tried to do an, a sort of population assessment of, of all the sites to see which sites were the most important. And they did this basically on the number of adult records or larvae that were found at sites, uh, as well as looking at you know, the habitat, you know, quality of the water quality of the sites. And, and so I, I sort of replicated that. So there is effectively, you know, um, five categories from very good to marginal. And I did the same that assessment sort of for these sites. So ra rather worryingly, I think we only had really two very good sites and eight in the good category. And then, you know, nearly 20 sites that are marginal or poor. Um, and then of the, the 22 sites that I looked at, they were in the, the 1995 Smith's report. Um, 16 of those sites had declined, including 11 of the very good and good sites. Um, but four sites had improved uh, and two sites had remained the same. But it's quite concerned that you, there's a general decline happening across the majority of sites. And there's actually very few very good or good sites for Northern Damselfly. So I found that 24 of the 43 sites required management, which is quite high. So two sites completely infilled like this one here with vegetation. You can actually walk across this site just in your wellies. Uh, you know, 11 sites were marginal with very little open water, um, filled up mostly with dense sedges and rushes and such likes. And then several sites, their dams need to repair, they are damaged. Uh, and one site had an invasive species, American skunk cabbage. Um, but most of the work really involves that getting a small digger in, or potentially you might have to do it by hand to actually create some deeper open water and then to repair or build new dams to try and raise the water table a little bit. And, and there's a couple of sites that also require <clears throat> some tree felling. Some of the sites on forest land in Scotland's new properties require some tree felling work. Okay, just to summarize um, the work that was done. So the sort of key things we've identified are how important sedges and standing water are for the species because that's present at nearly all northern damselfly sites, and as is things like sphagnum and pondweed and rushes. So they're obviously quite an important thing for potentially for adults to lay eggs on or for larvae you know, to sort of hide amongst. And then most sites are associated with woodland and are acidic in nature. But worryingly, half the sites uh, need management work quite urgently. And you know, if we can get those sites you know, improved, then that's only going to be benefit the population because many of those sites have got very few records and, and probably don't add much to the overall population. So it's really important we can get those sites back into a better condition than they are now. We have to be aware that new sites are being found quite regularly. I found three during this survey work, uh, 
because I found another new site earlier in 2020. And just recently, two sites have been found in Strathspey this year. And it's interesting. I feel that a lot of the new sites that have been found were looked at historically, quite a lot of them. And Northern Dam Supply weren't found at those sites, but are being now. And, and is that because the existing sites are declining in quality? So the species are looking for new sites? Or is there more comp competition? So there's, there's a <clears throat> little bit of a more understanding we need to find out about what's happening. Why, the, why are so many new sites being found? Is it just recorder effort or is there something else going on? So the key thing we now need to do is actually take some action because the 1995 Smith report, it, it had a list of recommended management work and nothing was ever done. So we need to now learn from that and actually take action as soon as we can to bring those sites into better management. So over the next few months, we need to finalize the site management plans and agree that work with the, the land managers. And then we need to look to appoint contractors to carry out the work in the autumn and sort out things like consents and, and such likes, because some of the sites are protected. But also what we also want to do is create some new ponds, because that could be beneficial for Northern Dam Supply. And the Kangaroos National Park Authority has got funding available to, to help do all this work this year, which is going to be great that we can actually get move, move forward and actually do this work. So thanks very much to them for providing the funding. The final thing I want to really say is, is a plea to all of you listening today, is that we need more people to be out there looking at potential Northern Damsel fly sites and particularly looking at the less visited sites. You know, we've got a list of all of those. You know, many sites have only been visited once or twice. And you know, the number of adults or larvae recorded from some of those sites is, is very low, usually less than five from nearly 20 sites. So we need people out there to try and improve our understanding and the actual population, because many of these sites could potentially harbor much bigger populations than we realize. So if, if anybody would like to undertake some survey work this summer, you know, targeted work at some of the this sort of sites, and please get in touch, uh, and I can provide you with the details. And that's all from me. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoy the rest of the program, and I can take some questions later in the program, or you can contact me directly. And just really like to say thank you to the four organisations that provided funding to enable this work to be carried out. So thank you very much.